you talk. At least it does on my end. Oh, oh. it's thing. It's, okay. it's cool. All right. So welcome, Tatiana Regal, to uh, Utah Valley University. We've got a really big group here. Yeah. And why don't you guys give them a, give her, let her know how you like the film. I'll do a little scan here. Yeah, you do. Hi, everybody. When we do this, we uh, we keep it here, so, like personal, so you don't okay. have to try to like see out into the nothing. Cool. And, um, and so it just feels like you're talking to somebody instead of a big crowd. Gotcha. Thank you so much for taking the time, and um, and it's a beautiful film. It's so great. And I'm glad you liked it. I I I, I like it more and more every time I see it. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start out with some questions just about you and getting started in editing and maybe working with Craig before I kind of go into some questions about the film. Mm -hmm. And I'll try not to be selfish because I could probably sit and talk to you for the entire time. Uh, but you. I'm I'm gonna turn it over to them. Okay. And we'll see what they come up with, and who knows who knows what they're gonna come. I'm up ready with. for anything. Okay. <laughs> So tell us about, I mean, we've got a group of film students here. I know some of them are great editors and aspiring editors. Um, tell me how you ended up with this career trajectory and how you started editing. Was that originally an interest or you fell into it or what? Uh, not originally, but it came pretty quickly. Yeah, I, uh, um, I grew up in Los Angeles and I loved movies. Um, and I knew I wanted to do something in film. I had no idea what that was. Um, both of my parents were academics, so they were like, you're going to college. So I did that. I was a political science major, and then I moved. I went to school in Boston, and then I moved back to LA um, and tried to figure out what I was gonna do in the film world. And the way I did that was not actually trying things as much as crossing things off the list. <laughs> so I didn't wanna act. I knew I wasn't going to be a cinematographer. I knew I'm not a writer, you know, and so I just sort of kept crossing things off and I was left with, with post-production and editing. And um, this was in the days of film and uh, especially with film, they needed a lot of bodies. Um, and I got a job working for free on a very, very small film um, where I was helping out um, sinking dailies. And I knew nothing when I walked in the door. I didn't know picture and sound were separate. I didn't, I didn't know anything. And so uh, they, um, in exchange for labor, gave me um, an education. And that's how I got started. All right. And that was it. From that job, you were like, ah, the sinking dailies. I want to do this forever. Pretty much, yes. At, at the end of that job, because I was not making any money at all and I was broke, I actually went back and started waitressing again for about two weeks. And... Um, Fortunately, got another job, and and that's been it since then. Excellent! Wow, that's yeah. a good story. Yeah. Um, eventually, along the lines, I've got to touch on this because yeah. uh, you were the uh, first assistant to Sally Menke for Pulp Fiction, and I'm sure okay. people bring that up to you all the time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, an obvious classic. Uh, were you? Uh, were you? As you were setting that up for her, aware of what you were working on or? I had no, I had no idea, truthfully, none of us did. Um, I was, at the time, I was um, starting to edit on, on my own. I'd been working as an assistant for a while and um, really liked it and was, was starting to edit really small, kind of lousy stuff. And then this whole nonlinear digital thing came about. And I thought, well, I really should learn this from the ground up. And I happened to get a call um, from Sally, who was looking for an assistant, because uh, she was doing a film. Um, she sent me the script to read. I read it. I loved it. I uh, loved it right away. Um, could not imagine that it was going to become sort of the classic that it that it was, but I knew I really liked it a lot. But really, I took the job mostly because I wanted to learn. At the time, it was Lightworks. It was you know, Avid wasn't wasn't um, sufficient for features at that point. And in fact, Lightworks really wasn't either. We couldn't have the whole movie online at one time. We could only have um, about two half to two thirds of the film online at a time. So if you wanted to work at the back half, you had to shut everything down, turn it all back on. 
the hard drives, each hard drive was three gigs and that was <laughs> most we could do. We had, we had a total of 15 gigs right. uh, of space wow. for Pulp Fiction. That was it. Huh. Um, anyway, so I, I started working for her then and I continued working for her uh, for about seven years. Um, and until I finally cut the umbilical cord and said, okay, I gotta, I gotta move on my own. And, um, it was really nice because I was at the point where I was starting to edit. And so I was looking at things really from that perspective and to be a fly on the wall with, uh, not, not just Quentin, but with Sally, who I think is one of the best editors ever, um, was, you know, I, I got a PhD in, in film editing being, it. yeah. Excellent. Okay, so let's talk about Craig. Um, this is your third movie with him or fourth? Third? Fifth. Fifth. Or fifth, yeah. Or fifth. Okay. Fifth. And, and we also did a uh, pilot of a TV series together called The United States of Terra. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and so tell us how you got together with him and how what your relationship is like and how's, how it's evolved. I mean, uh, that'd be... Yeah, well, I met him. Um, it was actually really, it's, it, it's actually it was really a coincidence that I met him. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, preparation and just dumb luck kind of align and things happen. And, and um, I happened to be at the Toronto Film Festival for another film that I did um, called PU 239. And I was that the director of that film was represented by the same agent as Craig is. Still, they both are still. Um, and I had met him a few times. He'd come to screenings and stuff like that. Anyway, we happened to be walking into the theater. Uh, it was the premiere of the film at the exact same time. And literally 30 seconds either way, my career would have been completely different. But I happened to be walking into the theater next to him, said, hello, how are you? He's like, hey, how are you doing? And, and um, you know, like every good agent, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, nothing. That's why I'm able to go to a film festival. <laughs> And um, he's like, really? Hmm, I think I might know a film for you. So he um, he uh, said, you'll get a call tomorrow, which I did. And I was sent the script. I read the script. And then the next morning at 7.30 in the morning, I had an interview with Craig, who happened to be in Toronto because it was Lars and the Real Girl, and they were shooting it in Toronto. Oh, God. Um, so he was up there scouting and doing prep. And so I met him before I got on the plane to come back to L.A., had the interview. Um, and then turned around and went back up for the shoot. And that, that's how I met him. Yeah. And, and how and now you're, I mean, how soon along are you brought in? I mean, obviously you're reading scripts before things are beginning and you're coming yeah. up. It, like, depends, it depends on the director. It depends on the director with Craig um, because we work together so much. He involved me very early in the process. For example, with I, Tanya, he was sending me, um, casting casting tapes and stuff like that. And we were talking a lot about actors and he sent me the script. And um, so that, that was wonderful. Um, you know, for example, he sent me a bunch of, a bunch of tapes of different actors for um, uh, Jeff Galuli. And right away, I didn't know who Sebastian Stan was. I, I had never seen him in anything. And um, right away I was like, that guy, that guy, you gotta get that guy. Um, you know, and they were looking for bigger names and they weren't sure. And then they did another uh, screen test with Sebastian and Margot, and it was just, you know, off the charts. And so it was, it became very clear that that was, that was the one. So with Craig, I'm very involved with other directors, not so much. I mean, you know, I, I get the script a little bit before they start shooting. Um, you know, I might meet them once. Sometimes it's just a Skype call. Um, and then you go to work. Okay. Yeah. So, so, uh, we did a Cine Skype several, like several years ago with, um, Barry Sonnenfeld. Yeah. He talks about something I always quote. I asked him about tone because yeah. he has shot so many different types of films. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you've also edited many different films types of films, yeah. genres, mm -hmm. um, and this film in particular walks a very fine line as far as tone goes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's about abuse, <laughs> and yet it's funny. Mm -hmm. um, it manages to make uh, me feel like I was a horrible person for ever thinking that Tanya Harding was was the worst person on the planet. It's amazing how it does that, isn't it? Yeah. 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 
really kind of makes you feel like you know opens up that you know so so you can you can hate her and like her same with the mother the mother is like a horrible person but always funny mm -hmm. um so uh tell us about tone and about editing this particular film and yeah. what were some of the things you were cautious of and and uh, thinking of going in well i uh I, I think that's one of the things that i um respect and admire so much about Craig. I think he's, I think he's a director and there are not that many of them that are really capable of um, really walking this very, very fine. Well, on Lars, we used to say that if we had gone five degrees in either direction with Lars, it would have been a disaster. And um, <laughs> because it's such a peculiar, uh, I don't know how many people have in the class have seen it, but it's such a peculiar, um, film and such a peculiar topic. I mean, it's about a guy who falls in love with a sex doll and, and, uh, you know, this, is, um, anyway, it's, it's, and, and it's, yeah, it's adorable. Yeah. It's a very, very sweet movie. Yeah. Um, a really lovely movie about unconditional love and, and community and all of these, you know, the best messages ever. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, but the, the log line is crazy. And, um, <laughs> And Craig is really, really good with with that. And it was it's very interesting because with the films that I've done with him, you know, the first one was Lars. Then we did Fright Night, which is a, a vampire horror type movie with a bit of comedy, not not enough. I had hoped that there would be more. And then we did Million Dollar Arm, which is a Disney, you know, film. And then um, uh, Finest Hours, which is another Disney film, but like a you know action, um, but sort of old fashioned action movie. Um, and then uh, I, Tanya, and, and they're all very, very different, but Lars and I, Tanya, I think are really his wheelhouse in terms of this crazy multi-tonal genre thing going on. Um, and, uh, and I love that. I, I, I love those sort of films. Harold and Maude is my favorite movie ever. And it's, that's got a bit of that. And that's, I, I think it's really, really hard to do and very challenging. And I like that with that. I like other films. I mean, I'm literally just, as I was telling you, I'm just finishing Girl in the Spider's Web right now, which could not be more different than I, Tanya. Nice. Um, and I like doing different kinds of films because especially everybody, you know, actors, cinematographers, directors, whoever can really get typecast as a particular, within a particular type of film. And I have tried my best, um, not that I have a lot of control over it, but I've really tried to constantly keep changing so that I don't get typecast because it just makes the job much more interesting and, and fun and challenging. I mean, it, it, any movie is gonna have a little bit of everything. Any movie will have a dramatic scene and a funny scene and maybe a little bit of an action scene. So you have to have the ability to do all of those things. So I think whenever they say, oh, we have to get an action person, I, I kind of think it's an absurd comment, but, um, Anyway, so that's that's what I um, really like about doing different types of films. Did you on this particular film have any sort of rule of thumbs as far as mm -hmm. as far as you know, like in this film we are we we can do this, but we can't do that because you know what? if you, as you know from watching the film, we did everything. Right. I mean, we literally threw the kitchen sink at it. There are jump cuts, freeze frames. Um, you know, uh, breaking the fourth wall, uh, everything that we could possibly do, we we did, and surprisingly, it all works. Um, I I never thought that it would, um, and and Craig didn't even think it would either. He shot everything both ways. You know, all of the scenes with breaking the fourth wall, he shot without that as well. Um, he shot all of the uh, voiceover. Um, on camera, so we could use any point of it as, as either interview or voiceover, um, and then those those parts also breaking the fourth wall. So he he was leaving all of his options open, um, which is super yeah. smart. Yes, yeah, and super hard considering the schedule, which I think was something ridiculous, like twenty eight or twenty nine days or something. It was absurd, and it was only a ten million dollar movie. It actually it ended up being eleven million dollars with music and stuff, but. Um, mm -hmm which we, you know, which we, even with that, basically stole because there's so much music in the movie. It's amazing that we got it for the price that we did. But um, it was, it was, it was a, you know, he, he bit off a lot for us all to chew and it was, it was fun. It was really challenging. What were your thoughts when you just even heard that that's what he wanted his next project to be? I thought my career was over. 
<laughs> I really did. I was like, oh, I, I was like, wow, I guess we're doing Lifetime movies now. <laughs> it was just like, that's it, boom. Um, yeah, there, there was a Lifetime movie, wasn't there? Before? Before there was, as there should be. It's a crazy story. But um, yeah, I, I was like, okay. Um, and then I read it and immediately knew that it was, it was going to be something really special. And then knowing Craig as well as I do, I knew that he would be absolutely perfect for it. So, um, so that then I was, I was fine. And, and then the be best, I mean, it just kept getting better and better the whole way down the line. As soon as dailies started coming in very, very early in the process, I was like, Oh my God, I think this movie is actually going to be really good. And it was, it just like kind of fell together in a really wonderful way. That's great. Yeah. Let me, let me step you out of, from Tanya a little bit and, and well, I guess not. I, what I'd like to know, uh, as we have, I have some people in here who are in my intro to editing class. Yeah. Um, how do you start on a scene? How do you walk through a process of just like, uh, uh working through a scene from, from scratch? Well, I, uh, I watch all of the dailies, um, quite thoroughly. Uh, I don't skip ahead. I don't, you know, go to the select takes. I don't do any of that. I start with take one. I go all the way through every single one of them. I think it's really, really important because, um, and it's very hard to do because uh, people shoot a lot, particularly with digital cameras tend to run and it really can suck up the time. And, it, you know, when you only have so many hours in the day, you know, if you're working on something and you're getting, you know, eight or nine hours of dailies, which is completely possible, and you have to watch everything, that's gonna take more than that time because you're stopping for notes and to load it up and to do all of these things. So, um, but I really, really watch every single thing because I think it's very important to have your initial reaction to a scene. That's a, the, the editor is, is really the, um, the only audience member involved in, in the filmmaking process. And we, and I try to hold on to that as long as I can. I don't like going to the set if I can at all avoid it for a, a number of reasons. One is I'm too busy to, uh, the other is I don't want to know what's there. I don't want to know the geography of the set. I don't want to know how long it took them to, to shoot something. Uh, I don't want to know a, an actor personally, if they're nice or not nice. I don't want to, hear the reaction of the of the crew uh to what you know if something's funny they all laugh and i think oh that's funny i must use it and and so i, I try to push all of that aside and really just pay attention to my initial and instinctual uh, reaction to a, a performance or a line or a moment an eye movement or whatever it is and i'll jot it down or i'll put a marker on it or whatever to remember that and then by the time i'm done watching all of the dailies in my head I kind of have an idea of what I feel like the scene should be. Um, that often changes. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, you know, sometimes you put scenes together and they stay that way almost completely till, till all the way through the whole process. Other times there are scenes that, you know, you couldn't possibly cut another way because you've tried so many versions. So that's how I start approaching it. Um, Sometimes, depending on the scene, honestly, I'll start in the middle of it. Sometimes I'll start at the end. Sometimes I'll start at the beginning. Sometimes I'll, um, I'll, you know, jump into something that I know is going to be really difficult to kind of get it off my plate. Other times I will procrastinate a bit and, and leave it for later. Uh, it depends on my mood. Um, but, but one thing that I do like doing um, is putting a scene together, getting from beginning to end, watching it a couple of times, and then putting it away for a day or two and then coming back with fresh eyes and looking at it again. And, you know, sometimes I look at it and I'm incredibly pleased and I'm, it's, it's exactly what I remembered. And other times I'm like, who did that? Cause I have no idea what that is. Hmm. Uh, and it was terrible. And I just rip it apart and start over again. So the short answer is there's no real way to do that, except that I would say, trust, trust your instincts uh, about what you want the scene to be. Always play for the emotion and the, and, and the story of the scene, not the cool shot, not the, you know, people can be very forgiving. If something's a little out of focus or a little buzz or a little this or that, nobody's going to notice that. You know, it's it really is just it's all about the emotion, emotion, emotion and story. Um, and um, and then, you know, as you get through the process, really show show what you're doing to people. 
Um, and listen honestly to other opinions. Don't get stubborn about what a scene is. I think that's something that really comes with time. Um, and it's really important to not um, just, you know. Get married. Yeah. Uh, it It's, you know, you start showing scenes to people. Well, first of all, as the film sort of evolves and you're putting all these scenes together out, out of order and you kind of string it all together and it and it be, your first assembly becomes um, the script. You know, this is your assembly of the script. It's not the movie and it's never going to be the movie. And that's why I hate it when they call it the editor's cut because that is absolutely <laughs> not the editor's cut. I, it's, it's just an assembly of the script and what they shot. Um, a lot of times you're throwing stuff in because you think wow, the director used this thing, I guess I should use that angle or this or that. And as you get to know it and shape it, it, you, it becomes something very different. And that process of it becoming something very different is really exciting and really fun. And that's why you should not get married to anything too early in the process. This is another reason why I say don't put music on too early in the process, because I think, um, I mean, I'm, and I feel very, very strongly about this. And not everybody does, but uh, a lot of times directors ask to see the first assembly. A as I'm, as they're shooting, I put stuff together and show it to the director right away. And Craig and I are very good about this. And when I go on interviews, I try to explain this to directors, and they usually are game. But I try to put a scene together um, and send it to them right away so they can see it. Uh, for a number of reasons. So they can see that they are getting the performances that they want, that the tone is is correct, that um, they don't want to make any adjustments or change anything or reshoot anything or whatever it is. Um, and it also allows us, with a director that I don't know very well, to begin a conversation and a discussion and dialogue about it to to under me to learn what they're wanting from the scene. So I can start to make little adjustments and changes. But in order to do that, you have to do it very quickly, and which means you can't do a lot of sound work or music or anything like that. Um, and the other huge advantage is that it allows the director to see basically the entire movie before they see it beginning to end. Watching an assembly the first time is incredibly painful. Mm. Um, it's a horrible experience for all involved. And um, it's not the movie, and it sends a lot of directors into total panic and- Depression. It, the total depression, absolutely, uh, for all of us involved. Um, and but if they've already seen it or most of it already, it um, it softens that blow a little bit, and they can start to look at it um, much more objectively, which is really nice. Is to get to that point as quickly as possible. Uh, anyway, back to the music. It, not putting music on for a while, I think, really forces you to be super efficient with the cut and to really make a scene work without music. You, you can make a scene work with music. You put it on it. It's easy and great and necessary and uh, an incredibly valuable part of the process. But if you can keep the music away for a long time, um, you can um, you can really be efficient and force yourself to really, really get that scene working, get a suspenseful scene. If you can, if you can have somebody, um, if you can have a scene be suspenseful uh, without music, it'll be really suspenseful with music. If you can get a scene to be emotional without music, it'll be really emotional with music. If you can get a scene to be uh, energetic and, and, and you know, filled with energy without any music, you're good. So that's why I don't like it. Also, once you start putting music on, you tend to sort of get married to those transitions. And it, it just, I think it slows the process down a lot. If you're br brutal about it and you keep the music away for as long as you possibly can until you just can't stand it anymore without music and then add that on, um, I think it really helps the process a lot. I couldn't agree more. So that's great. The, uh, I love it when people, smart people say things yeah. that I said. It also, it also, it's very hard to take music out once it's been in. So, this is why a lot of films, I think, these days have way too much music. Um, the, the people, the directors aren't trusting that the that the audience is going to feel that. So they have to say, oh, here, feel sad here, feel this here, feel whatever. Um, and then, all you know, it, and then they just can't take it away because it becomes flat after it's been there, even if it shouldn't be there. So Now, this movie is very music heavy and there's some sequences. Were there any sequences here that because of like, for instance, the ice skating or something like that, that you edited to music or even in that stuff? The, the, the skating I did because it, all of the stuff 
all of the um, sequences with her skating, we use the music or pretty much the music that she actually skated to, huh. um, you know, like ZZ Top and stuff like that. So with, with those, yes, I, I put those together with the music. Um, everything else I didn't. I didn't put any music in at all. There were a, one or two that Craig had chosen already, um, but we weren't sure of it, so I didn't really put it in very early. When I first showed him the first assembly, there was basically the um, skating sequences and maybe two other pieces of music. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think there were something like 41 or 42 pieces of music. Um, and so that we just, the, the assembly was in actually pretty good shape. And then we started, after about a week and a half, we started throwing music at it and just, um, that just inf began to inform a lot of stuff at that point too. And, 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 and because we had no money for music, we had the wonderful advantage of just putting in whatever we wanted, thinking that we'd never get it anyway. So we might as well at least enjoy it while we could. And then we ended up getting it. <laughs> so that was very nice. And the way we ended up getting it was um, we had an amazing uh, music supervisor who uh, actually got a lot of the artists to see the film. Um, and when they saw it, they then wanted to be a part of it. And so uh, not only did they say yes, which is a big hurdle, but they lowered their prices a lot too. Oh, so, that's cool. mm -hmm. I mean, just one last question. I want people to come up. Yeah. You can start coming up if you, if you know your game. Um, just for their point of reference, yeah. how, uh, how um, long does it take to edit a feature? I would say an average is about nine, 10 months, something like that. Um, this one that I'm on right now that I'm just finishing has been just exactly 10 months. Um, I, Tanya was a little bit shorter than that, mostly just because we didn't have any money and there was like no, no screwing around. We had to finish it up. Um, but I've also finest hours. I was on for a year and a half and um, that's too long. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, I really want to hear what these folks have to say. Come up, say your name, and uh, and you can adjust this this way if you want to be on that. So. All right. Hey, hi. So my name's Tabitha Jones, and my question is: You said you don't get married to a sequence early, but say you've had a minute to mm -hmm. kind of work with the material. Have you ever had a sequence that you really, really loved? But then the director's like, nah, cut it or like change it completely. Like oh, well, all the time. That's why you can't get married to it. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens all the time. Um, sometimes, uh, happily, things tend to work back often to that your original instincts because, um, again, you're sort of the audience member, and a lot of those original instincts are correct. Uh, so it, sometimes scenes go through this whole big circle and you know, you're working, working, working for weeks or months or whatever. And every now and then you're like, Hey, you know what, let me pull out my first version of that and look at it again. And there'll be a lot of aspects that end up going back in, um, because, because of that, because of that just sort of initial instinctual reaction. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Alex and I'm a, I'm a teacher here, but also I'm a screenwriter and I've got a project and it's weird because I was talking to the person I'm working with on this, and, and uh, we said, you know what, we've got to watch Itania because they kind of dealt with the same problem. And then a half hour later, I get the message from, wow. from uh, Dwayne that we're, you're doing this. So, and, and here's the problem. We, we're, we've been approached by, with a project that involves, it's a very important project, I think. It's, a, it's significant stuff. It's interesting stuff, but it's all about uh, uh, abuse and this sordid stuff. And, and the question we're going with is, okay, interesting. How do we make this entertaining? You know? Yeah, that's always a tough one. You know, the, the, these really um, tough subjects are hard to get an audience to sit down and watch, you know, because people do want to be entertained. Um, you know, the, the great thing about I, Tanya is that it had a lot of comedy in it. The, 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 the uniqueness of that story, I think, is that it, the advantage that we have is that it is a ridiculously absurd story, no matter how you look at it. It's just, it's insane. And so we didn't have to push that a lot. Um, 
Were you thinking about that as you were cutting? All the time. And in fact, the abuse was something that we were very, very uh, aware of for a number of reasons. One was uh, it's important to talk about. I mean, I think it's a subject yeah. that should not be swept under the rug. It needs to be talked about. It needs to, it, it, for, for her as a character for, and as a real person, um, and that was one of the things that we wanted to show is why she got to the point that she got to, to do, to yeah. be involved on whatever level, whoever you want to believe she was involved, not involved, whatever, what got her to that point, who, invo what informed her in her life to be that person. And you can't just start at the end. I think that's why so many people had such a judgment about her is like, Oh, her husband or whatever hired people to take out the opponent. Well, that's yes, no, maybe, I don't know. But what happened in her life from childhood, that created that person. And that's, and, and that's what's so dangerous about, you know, all of us as humans, you know, having such judgments about people, other people is that you don't know the backstory. Um, and so with, with anything with a very, very serious, serious um, subject, obviously you want to have some way of approaching it. That's, that is entertaining. Otherwise some things are just brutal and, you know, life is brutal enough. You don't want to sit and, and go through it again. This story, we were fortunate that, it could really, we could balance that. We had a lot of very um, lengthy conversations about how we were going to do the violence and how much we were going to show and how we were going to show it. And we, and Craig was really adamant about this and I think completely co correct about it, that we had to be really honest about it. There were, there were times we had some screenings early on um, where people said, oh, that's too much. You know, I feel like he's hitting her all the time. You don't need to show that much, you know. And we tried a couple of times to pull back on it. And you just didn't get the reality of her life. It was important to show that all. And although it's incredibly difficult, it was necessary to. And um, yet you have you have the audience laughing at one moment in in the middle of heartbreaking scenes. Well, and that's one of my favorite sections of the film is is uh, when when she skates um, and uh, the scene with her mother and the knife. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a really fun skating sequence. And then it goes to this very, very quiet, it starts off as a very quiet dialogue scene between her and her mom at dinner. And they're just sitting there and it, and it very quickly builds and explodes into this argument where they're screaming, yelling and the knife. And every single time we screen it, there's a huge gasp, uh, when the knife gets thrown. And then, um, it's ridiculously tense and, 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 and I've described it before where, I really wanted to stretch that tension as much as we possibly could um, and then break it quite in a very hard way with that, uh, with Allison, uh, the mom coming in and, you know, all, pro all families have problems line that is just absolutely hysterical. And it's, it's a, it's a device that is used in the film to, you know, to have all of this tension and then break it and give the audience a chance to laugh and be relieved, but really push them into that emotion, which I think is, Quite fun. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful work. I'm going to give some other people some a chance to talk. Sure. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Oh man. Oh, <laughs> uh, it just it doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where's my where's my step stool? <laughs> um. Well, hi. Um. Yeah. My name is Adam. I'm obviously one of the, I'm one of the students here. Mm -hmm. Let me try to stand a little taller. Um, I'm on my tippy toes. I'm pretty short. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the students here. I'm, I'm Dwayne's student and um, Alex's student okay. is just up here. Um, and to be honest, I really just wanted to get up here to pick your, pick your brain. And the thing is, I was in line the whole time trying to think of a question to ask you. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I do a lot of, I mean, I, I try, I direct, and I do a whole lot of writing right. um, to the best of my ability because I want to make major films, you know, and I don't want to be stuck, you know, um, just in a small, in a small town for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, just any, I mean, I guess based on the experience that you have had throughout mm -hmm. your life. I know you were born in um, in LA. I know you said that. Yeah, um, I, mean, I, was, I was raised, raised to a farm, but, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. If you want to do, do you have, have in LA or New York? Although now Atlanta, 
is doing a ton of stuff. I mean, it's all over the place, but yeah, you kind of got to get yourself there. Right. Yeah. Um, what, what ways would you, um, recommend getting there while I am, I mean, at least trying to get my name out there. Yeah. Well, uh, there are a number of ways you can do it. Um, you know, you can just plop yourself down in LA and start, you know, get some sort of job to, survive and pay pay the rent and stuff like that and uh, start meeting people there are a lot of um internships and uh god it's changed so much since since i got started but there are tons of internships and uh you know different things that like the academy does or even uh, the motion picture editors guild does where you can you can ace uh, the american cinema editors does this thing with um uh, students to, to get involved. It's a really good way of meeting people and um, also tr trying to hone exactly what you want to do. And all of the guilds offer that. You know, the Director's Guild does, the Writer's Guild does, uh, you know, um, production design, all, all of that. You, there are a number of different things. So if you have an idea more specifically of what you want to do, if you really want to direct, yeah. try to do one of those things or, um, uh, you know, I would say just work as much as you can, you know, come out here and get involved with other young people who are making films, uh, help out on um, student films from, you know, with kids from USC or uh, AFI or whatever, just to get experience and start meeting people. And, and it's, it's so much about that. It's really about who you know and how, how you know them. And um, because everybody works freelance and, you everybody just kind of gets up and moves around and it's you know it's who who you know and who heard about a job you know that you can get in on first you know mm -hmm. i have people calling me all the time saying they're looking for work and i'm like great you know send me an email every three months let me know what you're doing i may or may not respond to it depending on how busy i am but at least i have an idea of what you're doing and what you've done last and if you're available and when i get a call for somebody who needs somebody right away it's going to be the last one or two people that contact me um, that I'll pass on their name. So, you know, that's what you have to do. It's, there's a, there's a big financial part of it, you know, where you have to be able to survive unless you've won the lottery or you have super wealthy parents, you know, um, which I don't know anything about, but, uh, you know, you have to, you have to figure out some way of surviving and, and, um, and because it's always freelance, you're always going to have that problem. So even when you start making money, you want to always, take a job because it's good for your career, not because you need a job. And so sometimes that means, you know, living way below your means so that you can wait a little bit longer or so that you can have the freedom to really try to strategize. And, uh, you know, that's what I would say. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. You bet. Uh, hi. Hey. Uh, my name's Saul. I'm a former student of uh, Alex's, and I'm a current student of Dwayne's. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are some um, what's some advice you can give to um, us so we can be um, better editors? Um, well, let's see. Um, practice, you know, really <laughs> practice. I, I, I genuinely do think there's a part of it that's very instinctual. Um, there's a part of it that's talent and there's a part of it that is just practice. Like, you know, uh, if you're a dancer or a violin player or whatever, you got to practice. And it's the same, I think with, with editing, um, you, you learn a lot from coming up against problems. You know, um, it's one of the great things when you're starting out, you tend to work on really lousy movies when you're starting out, but it teaches <laughs> you how to work certain problems. Some yes. of the bigger, better films that are shot perfectly and, and the performances are great and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, of course they, they cut together, you know, in a very simple way because you've got everything you need. Um, in those situations where you don't have everything you need, you've got to be really very creative and try all kinds of crazy stuff to, to get to that point. So um, that's that's the biggest thing is just keep practicing, keep doing it. Do it, cut everything you can, um, try it different ways, uh, show it to people, get feedback. Um, let them be brutally honest with you and be open enough to listen to the constructive criticism. Um, you know, like if you're showing somebody a, a, a cut of something, even if it's, if it's a short or, or a feature or anything like that, um, screen it, 
talk to them about it. And at the end of it, see if you can kind of go through and even scroll through the cut. Because sometimes at the end of seeing something, people don't remember everything. They kind of remember the, the basics, but they won't remember a specific thing. So if you're sitting there like scrolling back through it and talking about, hey, wait, that scene. I had a question about that that I forgot about, but you know, this is what I think. And so that can be very, really helpful too. Um, and, um, and then just be willing to try different things. I mean, still, I, I, I've been doing this forever. And to this day, sometimes a director will have me try something that I'm like, oh, it's not gonna work. And, um, and I'm wrong, it works, you know, it's, it's, uh, and, and every single time I'm like, God, why am I not, you know, more open to that? And I think it's something that we all have to constantly force ourselves to do. So that's, that's what I'd say. Okay. All right. And then, um, just one more question on a daily basis. Uh, how long, uh, did you have to, uh, work? How much did you have to, uh, put in every day, um, to edit? Uh, well, you, when I'm working, it's, you know, it's pretty much all day. It's, uh, when we're in daily, you know, generally it's more, I, I really, really wholeheartedly believe that you need, um, breaks and time off and life and go home and have dinner with family and stuff like that. So, um, there are a lot of people that, um, dive into work and just are there 20 hours a day. And I think it's really harmful. Um, I think there's a point of, uh, a no return, a po point of diminishing return often in a person's day. Um, so, you know, I'm a morning person. I tend to work to get to work early. Um, you know, I like to get to work by between eight or eight 30 during dailies, um, sometimes a little earlier. And then I like going home at six, seven, eight o'clock at night, you know, so it's usually about a 12 hour day. Um, even still, um, and, and if days, which they often do go later than that. I mean, I just had a day where frantically trying to finish this thing that comes out all too soon. Um, I was at work from, I was at the mixing stage at eight in the morning and I didn't leave work until 1230 at night. So oh. I don't recommend days like that, but they do happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I would try to keep it to a normal, you know, 10, 10 ish hour day is, uh, is enough. You know, there, there are deadlines and you got to meet the deadlines. So, yes. and it really helps to work efficiently. You know, your days can be shorter if you're really concentrating on it and not, you know, um, uh, it's pretty easy to, to get on, to, to lose concentration and, you know, talk to the other people you're working with a little bit too much or whatever. Um, but yeah. They're long days. Yeah. And there, and I've been working a lot on this one. Depends on the schedule and stuff. On this one, I've worked a ton of, you know, seven day weeks too. Um, the, the studios are really pushing these schedules to the absolute limit. And, um, you know, we, we finished, we're watching the final DCP tomorrow morning and it comes out in Europe in two weeks. So, wow. yeah. So we're down to the last minute. Oh, all right. Well, thank you. Sure. Yeah, how are you holding up? Good. I'm good. You got a few more people online. Okay. Hi, my name's Errol. How are you? Uh, I'm 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 good. Um, this is uh this this was a favorite film of mine from last year. Just, oh, cool. But, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I I guess I had a I've heard a lot of everyone kept stealing my questions as oh, I was yeah. coming up. Uh, so this can't be last in line. <laughs> I've, I've heard a lot of uh, I've heard a lot of kind of horror stories about like like people work like signing up to work on something and then it turns out they're working with the wrong people. Mm -hmm. um, how do you discern between something that's going to be good and something that's going to be good like for your career? If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, well, there are um, there are three reasons to do a job. One is the uh, the actual film what you think the script do you like the script do you think it's a good story um you know who's in it stuff like that the second reason is, is the people that you're working with and the third reason is the money um and ideally you know when you're early in your career it's got to be one of those things you're either doing something just for the money or just for the people or just for the the script in the and the film um as you move on you try to accumulate more than one of those things on each film. You try to have great people, great money. Usually it'll be a lousy movie. <laughs> Sometimes it'll be a great movie, lousy money, great people. Sometimes it'll be, you know, 
a great movie, uh, great people, and and you know you never you never get all three of those, so just put that out of your mind. Um, but if you can try to have some combination of that, depending on where you are, um, you know the reality is, like I said before, you, everybody's got to pay their rent, and you have to make decisions about you know how how you're going to work things. But and you have to strategize, and you have to be very careful about. Um, how you live and live below your means and make sure that you can um, take the, the jobs that are good for a career. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you have no idea. Um, you think it's going to be great and it just doesn't do anything. And other times it surprises you and uh, you know, you took it for some other reason and it turns out to be, you know, a really, a really great thing. Regardless, every single job you will meet people and the, they will, come back into your life in some other way later on. Um, it's really important to be good to all the people that you work with, that you work, who work for you and that you, who you work for, um, because, uh, you're going to run into them again. It's a, it's a, it's not that large a pool of people and everybody's freelance and everybody gets up and moves over a chair and, you know, you could have been working with somebody who's, um, who you can't stand or maybe, uh, was really, really just a jerk, and you may have to run into them again. And and uh, that's where it's helpful to be able to have a little flexibility and say, you know what, I'm not taking that job because I know that guy's a jerk, and I do not want to work for them. Um, but if you if you are if you need a, a paycheck, you know, you may have to do that, but at least you know what you're getting into. So um, that's it's tough. It's it's hard. Sometimes you have no idea. Sometimes somebody you think is fantastic and when you actually get in the trenches, you realize they're not that pleasant. But the great thing is it's freelance and they end. The job ends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Sure. There we go. Hi, I'm Nate, and uh, I wrote down my question, so I will read it. <laughs> okay, I hear stories all the time of cinematographers and directors turning to other movies for inspiration while they're working on their projects. Mm -hmm. Are there any movies that you turn to for inspiration while you're editing? That's a good question. Um, there's no specific film that I would turn to. Um, if I'm doing something, uh, if I'm doing... Let's see, how would I do this? If um, I think one of the things you really want to be honest with in, in terms of editing is what is the real DNA of that particular movie. Um, and you don't want to try to, you know, force it into being something else. Um, so, you know, when, when you're a cinematographer or production designer or something like that, you're still really trying to form and shape what this possibly could be. But once it's actually in the can, it sort of is what it is, and and you have to be really honest with the DNA of that particular film. Having said that, if I am working on a particular scene that, um, you know, I don't know, probably particularly with an action type scene, and I just want to get some ideas and figure out how much can you really get away with, um, I might watch, you know, an action film and kind of look at it and go, hmm, okay, because I sometimes particularly with that, it's always amazing to me how much you can get away with it, just, you know, in terms of continuity and, and jumping things and what you actually show and what you don't show. And sometimes if I will go and watch another film, it will give me the courage to, uh, to try stuff myself. Cool, cool. I really like that. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi, my name is Ashley. And my question for you is, what are some of the qualities you have as an editor that make you stand out and get jobs? Uh, let's see. Well, um, I think one of the more important qualities an editor can have is uh, you have to be able to get along with a lot of different kinds of people. You know, directors, there are a lot, there are a lot of personalities in a cutting room, um, a lot of type A personalities. <laughs> these in the cutting room with directors or producers or sometimes actors come in. And um, I think, it, it, unfortunately, and I think this is one of the things that um, has caused people not to appreciate editing as much as they should. Um, you know, you don't hear a lot of actors uh, thank their editors um, in their speeches, and they really ought to. <laughs> um, 
because an editor is really, and I think a quality that an editor really needs is to kind of stay in the background. And um, it, our job is not to make our movie. Our job is to help the director make their movie. Um, and we don't necessarily always agree with the decisions that director is, is making necessarily. But one of the really unique things that happens with a true collaboration is that you, you, ha you know, one plus one doesn't even equal two. It starts to equal three or four or five. Um, which is, which I think is something really, you know, like to really examine that meaning if you just listen to the director, you have one person making that movie. If a director will listen to the people around them and you start to build off of each other's ideas, you know, they get something from the editor, the editor gets something from the director and the director takes it from there and takes it up a step. It just starts to get better and better. And so I would say that's a quality that's really necessary with editors. You have to be able to stay in the background, but also, um, you know, give examples of ideas and participate in it and, uh, and allow sometimes other people to really take ownership of it. when you're like, you really want to say, Hey, wait a minute, that was my idea. <laughs> um, and, and to be able to, you know, deal with all the personalities in the room N and not just with the people above you, but with the people that work with you as well. Um, you know, I think, I think I, I try to have a cutting room that is fun. You know, I want to get up in every morning and go to work and have a good time. I do not want to get up and be like, oh, I don't feel like going there today. It's a horrible feeling. We spend way too much time at work and this is in any career. Um, you know, you want to enjoy what you do every day with, of your life because it's just miserable otherwise. And so I try my best to have it have it be that way for the people who are working for me. Um, and uh, and I also know that I couldn't do my job without them. Um, I couldn't do it at all. And so they're they are uh, they have tremendous job security by um, in a lot of ways because I'm de very dependent on them. Um, and because I am, I want to make, I want to make it as much fun as possible. So that's what I would say, you know, you have to have, you have to have um, a personality that can deal with a lot of different kinds of personalities that can deal with the people who are above you and the people who are below you. And uh, you know, just it's get a psychology degree basically. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, Hey. Hello, Tatiana. I I was one of the students. I just want to mention this really quick. That went with Dwayne to Edit Fest this oh, cool. August. So I heard your panel there. Oh, so hope great. I didn't repeat too much. No, it was great. So cool. I mean, admittedly, I just didn't want to repeat it as well by asking you questions about Pulp Fiction. But <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. So I guess my question would be because one of the panelists that we talked to talked about how rather than finding work as an editor through you know being an assistant editor, he says to just go straight for the editing jobs. And I guess, what would be your takeaway on that as opposed to? Yeah, I mean, you certainly can do that. Um, and there is a, a very valid argument to do that. Uh, it saves some time and stuff like that. Um, I will never, ever, ever um, believe that for me because I had the opportunity to work with somebody like Sally and um, I never, I never would be where I am now without uh, being a sponge around her for a number of years. Um, it, you know, you can go and become an editor right away, but I think that what happens with stuff like that is you tend to reinvent the wheel each time, as opposed to sort of seeing how the wheel really is and then taking it and making it yours. Um, I think it would help um, if everybody understood that about all aspects. You know, if I if I understood um, more what the sound mixers are doing and what the visual effects people are doing and what the composer is doing, if I really understood that, maybe even by working at at in those positions earlier in my career, uh, it would make me a better editor now. So, I I would. Um, I would uh, caution people from going too quickly just to editing. Um, I think I think having a, a well-rounded uh, um, view of how things are done is important. Um, there are certain reasons things are done certain ways, um, and learning those could save you a lot of headaches. Well, that's that's good to know. I mean, I was 
I was figuring it'd be quite the contrast to that yeah. opinion. And it, it, one is not mutually exclusive. You can work as an assistant and cut your own stuff at the same time. Um, you know, on nights and weekends or in between gigs. I mean, that's what I was doing while I was working with Sally. As soon as I realized what an amazing editor she was, because I was already cutting, I worked with her as an assistant. And in between jobs with her, I went off and cut, you know, small crappy movies. And, and I could then, you know, sit there and say, oh, wow, what would she do? And then I'd go and work with her again. And I'd have that a little bit more in my mind as I was observing. And so I think you can, I think you can do both. All right, that's good enough. Thank you very much. Hey, Charlie, we've got three people left. Sorry. Okay, good. That's the end of the line. Hi, Tatiana. Hey. I am Jay. Uh, congratulations on the films. Thanks. Um, so I have a ton of questions, but apparently I'm limited to one. Okay. Um, so I guess this one would be um, a lot of the female biopics have had female editors. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working on a few projects myself. Um, a lot of them are female driven leads mm -hmm. and I'm cutting them myself. Mm -hmm. sure there's a feminine touch that is needed to make these films. What would you suggest? Well, um, besides well, hiring a female editor, I would, I would, uh, I would say it's important to have a, a sense of diversity, um, in the whole filmmaking process because you're making a story for, you know, hopefully you all want your movies to be seen by a lot of people. Um, and I think, you know, like, for example, in my cutting room, I really try to hire um, a, people who are not like me because I want to show a scene to them and I want to get their opinion. And they often have a very different take uh, on a scene than, or, or on the film as a whole than I might have. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if, if, if it's a, female driven story. Um, I think it's very important to have women in the cutting room because uh, it's a bit presumptuous that it happens all the time. Um, I have a very good friend of mine who um, is sort of, she's an editor who is sort of fallen into this genre of uh, YA films. Um, and she's very, very frustrated. She gets called in a lot to recut these films. Um, because inevitably it'll be a male writer, a male director, a male editor, male producers, and they're making a movie about a 13 year old girl. And guess what? They don't know about a 13 year old girl very much. Um, so uh, it doesn't mean that they can't. I mean, but I think it's helpful to have a variety of people in the cutting room and on the film in general to, to add things because every now and then somebody will say something and it's, and it's completely not in my world. And I'm like, wow, okay. I had no idea. And that helps me do it. So yeah, I mean, I would, I would highly recommend it I, and not just the male female thing, but I think it's a good thing as a, as a director to not cut your own stuff. Um, I, I think it, I think it's, it's a valuable thing to have somebody else uh, be a sounding board in there for you. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hey. hey My name is Sebastian. I was also at the Edit Fest. I actually could talk to you for like. A I was going to say, you look familiar. Yes, you remembered me. Um, <laughs> sweet. That's, that's all I wanted to do. No. Um, so I just wanted to ask a question about because uh, so I'm kind of new to editing, but I love it. And that, that's you know, what I feel like I want to do. However, my issue that I'm, uh, and you kind of touched up on this, but you talked about how you start an edit. Mm -hmm. I don't have that much of a problem with that as to how to finish an edit and know that I'm done. Uh, Cause a lot of times I want to say like, you know, I finished something because of the deadline or because, you know, it's been 10 hours and you know, I'm done. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes I'm, when I watch it back, when I, or when I see it, I just think, you know, I should have changed that. I wish I would have had like added more in yeah. that scene. Welcome, welcome to the world. Movies don't get finished; they get released. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, just, that's, that's just very. It's a very, very common, very common feeling. Uh, you know the the, and, and I think you know you will continue to make changes to things until until you're not allowed to anymore. Um, that always happens. Uh, but also, you know, at a certain point, you'll start to feel something really come together and, and you know, you'll, you'll have confidence that it's working by showing people and by, um, you know, their feedback. Um, 
and then you know you have to trust a, a, a certain thing again a lot of times once you when you're putting stuff together things kind of go together very well the first time I mean, it may be too long or whatever but your original instinct on certain things often is is um correct okay so trust your instincts okay yeah. great thank you sure Hello, Tatiana. I just want to say thank you um, for this sure. uh, web CineScape that you're doing, and thank you for being a role model for other women. I'm working more in the directing room. I'm a, a student of good. Wayne, sorry, the laptop's right. Yeah. The laptop. Oh, okay. I was using it to help brace my question. Ah. Um, but I'm hearing a lot about how it's good. Just like you said, being well-rounded, directing, editing helps with being a better director and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I was looking through some of the posts about I, Tanya. One of them is at the end where that final cut wasn't what was anticipated. And in the post, it says that Craig suggested the alternate ending to the script. Did you have, did you suggest that alternative ending of how mm -hmm. they, he that it sort of came about in a number of ways he when he read the script um he very early on thought that it should end uh with the boxing um originally in the script the uh the boxing was just sort of part of a larger montage that that same same basic voiceover was there but the montage kind of continued it was a much smaller little bit of the boxing and then it continued with uh other scenes that were shot but not not obviously didn't end up in the final with um, where Tanya meets her current husband and then uh, you see her with her with her husband and her son and they're hunting and all of this stuff and that whole end monologue kind of continues over all of that um, and we originally it was it was funny because um, when they were shooting uh, they were going to shoot the boxing but margot actually hurt herself a little bit so she couldn't she couldn't do the boxing right away so we were gonna they decided to wait about six weeks or something and go back and shoot the boxing and of course um the the studio and stuff was like oh well are you know are you sure we need the boxing do we really have to go back and spend that money and craig was absolutely very adamant correctly uh that it was it needed to be done and so what we did was we actually cut together a little temp sequence using, um, uh, what was that movie, the boxing movie with Hilary Swank? Oh, um, Million Dollar Baby? Yeah, we cut together a little sequence with some shots from Million Dollar Baby and some um, photos of the real Tanya Harding um, in her boxing, uh, doing the boxing. And we cut together a little sequence there in the montage of everything else. Um, but Craig, I think, knew all along he really wanted to end it with the boxing. And so when we then when they actually went back and shot the boxing, um, he he shot this incredible stuff with the fans and with all of this great slow motion and everything and and shot the very last scene, uh, the very last shot with her again, breaking the fourth wall and not doing that. Um, so he had the option. And and then we just chose that one you know, pretty quickly because it was just fantastic. And, and thematically, I think it's really good for the character because she, um, I love the shot that just stays on the mat there and um, and she gets up and that's just so symbolic of, of her, of, of Tanya Harding. I mean, she just keeps getting knocked down and she just keeps getting back up. And, um, and I just thought it was a great way to end the movie. Perfect, thank yeah. you. Sure. Well, you made it. Thank you so much. This was so great. Cool. I do have one last question. Yes. You've been 10 months on uh, Spiderweb. Yeah. Do you schedule some time off now? Absolutely, I do, yes. Yeah. I'm kind of actually hoping to be off, although I just got a call about a, a little something that might just be a few weeks. But um, I, I would like to be off through the end of the year. Um, I'm hoping that Craig has another movie um, sometime in the beginning of the year. Uh, but you know, until they actually start shooting, um, I, you know, you never know things come and go all the time. Um, I always say, I don't, I don't actually think I have the job until I finish. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, I would like to get something, you know, January ish. I'd like to take, yeah, November, December off. It's time. Well, so would I. Yeah. It's so great to uh, talk to you. Thank you so much for taking yeah, You bet. I hope the uh, screening goes great tomorrow morning. And, uh, Fingers crossed. Everyone, I'm
So, thank you again. You bet. Have a good night's sleep. You too. Thanks. Bye bye. All right. So long. Oh, wait. Uh, and